Welcome to all Villa, no filler. Remember to subscribe to the show, follow us on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Aston Villa play Everton this Saturday at Villa Park. The Toffees go into the game having started the season with three big defeats. Uh, to talk about the game, I'm joined by Matt Jones from the Blue Room podcast and Liverpool Echo newspaper. Matt, it's good to speak to you again. Um, why has the season started so poorly for Everton? Yeah, I mean, thanks for having me on. It feels like every time we speak, it's either selling a really good player to you or <laughs> the loads of defeats. So, um, always a always a joy. Um, but yeah, it's God. Why has the season started badly for Everton? It's um, it's it's hard to like say exactly why. To be fair, I think I think the one thing you could, you could say is that the best player is out injured, which sounds very straightforward. And Jared Brantford, he was obviously fantastic last year swept up in terms of the, the individual awards um, and was obviously linked to a, a big move in the summer. Um, and he's been massively missed. Uh, Michael Keane's coming for him. And a, a, while Keane's not been awful, I just think he disrupts the defence a little bit. I think him coming in means the other players are going to play a little bit differently. So there's that. Um, they've had a few injuries in key positions, like Seamus Coleman, even at his age, is still a key player for us. So when he's not fit, right-back's a, a big problem. Um and the managers maybe just kept faith with a few players who who did okay for for a spell last season, just did that little bit too long. You know, he went to the first game of the season playing Dwight McNeil, Decore, Harrison behind Dominic Carver Lewin, having signed um, in DI and Lindstrom on loan. Um, so it didn't really feel fresh. It just felt like a bit of a continuation of last year. And I think ultimately the Everton of of this season have, have not had the same sort of backbone that they had last year and showing the same sort of um you know solidity you know where it feels like when something's gone against them the the roof has, has caved in you know and that was evidence against Brighton on the first day it was evidence against Tottenham probably the entire 90 minutes to be honest and then of course uh, most jarringly and most heartbreakingly it was evidence on 87 minutes a fortnight ago when they were touring up and, and absolutely cruising and and the the roof caved in so it there's a there's a lot of different things from you could you could go really deep into it you could look at substitutions, you can look at personnel selections, you can look at the manager, you can look at the ownership. Uh, that all bleeds in as well. But I think a lot of it as well is just down to the fact that the best player has been injured and that has had a big imp- impact on us too. Yeah, and when I did a bit of research on Everton, I actually found that you started last season as well by losing your first three, including one really bad day out at Villa Park, which I went to. And when I watched that game, I thought, oh, I really think Ever- Everton in trouble. But then by the end of the season, you're actually despite the points that she's quite comfortably stayed up. Um, you know, uh, so do you think, you know, given the fact that you lost the first three last season and lost the first three this season, is there just a trend with Deitch teams that maybe they're just slow to get going? Yeah, I think that I think that's fair. But I think what I would say about last season and maybe the Villa game last year was the the outlier in this was the we had two home games either side of that game against um, Fulham and against Wolves, and they played relatively well. Created a lot of chances, should have won both of those home games, and ultimately um, ended up losing both with late goals against us. Um, Brighton was was not Brighton at home was not that type of performance. I think that the game just got away from Everton, and I think what you know it's it's, it's weird to say because against against Bournemouth for eighty five minutes they they were really good, and you could you could put that into the same category that, as those two matches start last season. But what happened in the, in the last nine minutes was just so bad. Like, just total loss of composure and shape and belief. Like, I've, I've never seen uh, a, a nine-minute spell quite like it in, in my life watching football. You know, I mean, Everton have had loads of these down the years. Um, like, really bad collapses late on. But that was just on another level. Um, so, I've had... And I think ultimately games like that and results like that, albeit it's never happened before in the Premier League, a team's been 2-0 up on 87 minutes and lost. But those sorts of collapses, and I think, you know, the way everyone felt after that and the way I, you know, I still feel about that game, really, I think I think they leave a scar and mm-hmm. they're going to be tough to get over. And I think it's going to be really hard for, for everybody to kind of overcome that unless they overcome it very quickly, I think. And I'm not necessarily talking about Saturday because that's it's going to be a really tough game, but mm-hmm. less than away after Villa and then Palace and Rome the weekend after that. They, they feel like really big games. It just feels like Everton need to get over the line in, in a tight game very quickly. Uh, otherwise, that Bournemouth scar will just... Sorry, that Bournemouth wound will not become a score. It will just become a scab that, that constantly gets knocked off us. 
Yeah, I mean, I watched the extended highlights of that game. Something I observed happened. I, I thought your players were absolutely knackered in the last kind of, from about the 87th minute on, and were giving the ball away in really weird positions. And just from looking a bit tired, I mean, do you do you think tiredness was a factor? And do you think maybe Deitch's substitutions weren't quite right? Is that what happened or is there various factors to it? Yeah, well, loads loads of different things play into it, but I think the substitutions is, is definitely one. Um. Bournemouth made five changes before Everton had made any, and while while I couldn't sit there and I'd say like I felt like they were were coming back into the game or or the substitutions that Ariola made didn't necessarily worked really well. Once they scored, it did work really well. They were energized. Everton were would look very lead and legged, and um, there were really tired players out there. And I think it's it's one of those that when you're watching it and you're tuning up, you, you can see players. Flagging, and you're not you're not that concerned because you're dominating the game. And the opposition are doing nothing. Um, so I think the fact that he didn't react after they'd scored was was a, a big big issue. I think you know the only change that he makes between Everton going to two one to between two two and then three two is he brings better one for for Carver Lewin. And you know thinking back to that game, um, Irabuna, who I'm sure we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later. It was out, you know, excellent. Had a really good game for seventy minutes. You could just see. It's a lad who's not played much senior football. You think it was yeah. his sixth Premier League start, and he, he was really flagging. And Everton had Decore on the bench. They had James Garner on the bench. Seamus Coleman, who I mentioned, that, that had a really good game, um, but was flagging massively. He played two games in a week after coming back from injury. And we had, listen, not his biggest fan, but Ashley Young is in the squad. He is there on the bench. What If he's not there for that situation to come on and try and close down wingers and, and show the game up when one of his, you know, other colleagues in that position is clearly flagging. What's the point of having him around? So, you know, Dice has done his press conference today and he's been adamant that the substitutions were, were nothing to do with it, which I, I, I just can't get on board with. But I, I, I just think everybody panicked. Like, they, they, they were coasting and then as soon as that goal goes in, the players panic. The manager on the sidelines going absolutely wild, screaming at them. Obviously, the supporters all think, oh no. And it just... You know, feeds into the cycle, doesn't it? And, and everybody's kind of loses the head gradually. So, um, it was remarkable to see. Like, just never felt like that in my life. Coming out of a of a football ground, it was it was staggering the way in which it, it all unfolded. Um, it was very much the classic car crash in slow motion. But it actually felt like it was sped up weirdly. It was it was, it was a bit like that. So, yeah, tough one to take. But I think the manager's got to take a lot of responsibility for it. Um, as much as the players have just got to kind of keep their head a bit better as well. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's a really it's a really severe dent. Um, but you know, now you've got Aston Villa this weekend. I mean, how do you feel about the trip to Villa Park? Not great. <laughs> um, I think when I've been on this before, at the Villa, I just feel like one of those teams, quite a few teams that just always seem to get one over on us and make us look a little bit silly. And you know, I'll go back to Ashley Young in two thousand eight at Goodison Park in that game. Um, I remember going to. Now, funnily enough, I was watching highlights of old Everton Villa games today because I think Stylian Petrov put it on Twitter, a great goal he scored at Goodison. Mm. And I was looking at it and thinking, I didn't even remember that game. And then <laughs> I, look, I look I look back and it was it was 2-2. I think I think Everton were really good and Villa scored a couple to equalise. And I think Ag Bond Lahore scored right to the end as he always did against Everton. Um and like it, this feels like the most like two two game and Premier. Like they've, they've drawn two two so many times these yeah. teams. And with, like certainly in the Moyes Martin O'Neill. Here is they were great games, but it felt like Villa, like as much as maybe Everton finished above Villa a bit more often in that those times, it felt like Villa when we played each other always just got one over on Everton, like they'd score late on. Remember one year, um, Everton were 3 1 up at Villa Park and Villa scored twice. I think uh, Milner scored a free kick and Barry scored a penalty and it finished free all. Mm. Um, so Villa, even when Everton were quite good, I was always quite wary about playing them, <laughs> and, and now obviously it's um, you know, the, the gap between the two teams is is, is quite significant, isn't it? And, I think that will be. I've not seen. I've not seen loads um, of Villa's games this season. Obviously, no one has come in and seems like he's at the ground running, which is not a great surprise. But um, yeah, nervous. I think I, I'm just hoping that the, the breaks done everything good in the sense that they can kind of regroup a little bit, forget about what happened um, before uh, the international break against Bournemouth. And hopefully, you know, the manager was quite coy on Bramford today, so he's been back on the grass, which is is one of Dice's terms. Um, if, we, if we can get him back into the team and he, he's, he's fit, that, that, that's a huge boost for us just in terms of being a bit more solid. Um, but yeah, like I mean, a point would be amazing for Everton, like mm. if, if we're being totally honest. Um, so yeah, um, 
not great, but hoping for an improvement. Certainly a performance at Tottenham away when they were absolutely awful for 90 minutes. If we can go there, make a good account of ourselves, not completely lose the plot when we concede, then that would be a step forward from what is a very low bar for us currently. Yeah, and uh, how do you think Everton might approach this game? Will it be a kind of 4-4-1-1, sit quite deep, keep it tight, invite pressure? And how, yeah. how do you think they'll go for it? I, I wouldn't surprise me if he went, went to a back five, actually. Um, yeah. like Certainly if Bramford's fit or is near in fitness and you can get him into the team. Um, because I think they played that system in the League Cup game last year, where Everton were actually really good for, yeah. for the first 45 minutes. And obviously Villa brought a few uh, big hitters on the second half and got a goal back, but Everton hung on. Um, but that, that seemed to work quite well at Villa Park last year. Um, and yeah, I, I think Coleman being out potentially as well is will be a worry for him. I don't think he'll want to play Ashley Young as, as a right back, given the, you know, certainly your left hand side with Rogers going over there again and, and Luca Dean. It feels like he could get swamped at the game quite quickly. Um so once Raj went to a back five, maybe play James Garner as a, as a right wing back as he's done in the past. Um so yeah, we have, we haven't got loads of options, certainly, but um I think it wouldn't surprise me if he just went. Like, like Dice doesn't feel like the sort of manager that when you've had a result like Bournemouth, you'll look at the, the attacking side and say, well, that was really good. We scored two goals. Let's let's go more attacking. He's, he's going to go the other way. He's going to go more defensive and try and be more robust. Um, but I think what we've seen from some of his teams in the past is that there's quite a fine line between being defensive and passive. You know, there's been there were games at the end, of, there were games last season where Everton were defensive away from home and came away and, and won the game and were really aggressive and solid and structured in the shape. Um, they went to Tottenham and were passive. They just weren't in the game. They didn't engage at all and just got, got trounced for, for 90 minutes. So I hope it's more of the former than the latter, but confidence is low. The pressure is on a lot of players. The pressure is on the manager. Um, I think it takes something really, really big for Everton to raise themselves to, to get a result on Saturday. Mm, and, you know, I looked into some of the stats from last season. And I found that Everton were the second highest scoring team in the league when it came from set pieces, 18 go- goals in total, I think, only behind Arsenal. Um, do you think that's the main way you could hurt Villa this weekend? Could it be through like a Dwight Manil corner to the back post, you know, aerial balls up to Dominic Calvert Lewin? Is that the primary way you could do it? Or could a player like Illumin and Jai, you know, go at one of our fullbacks? Like, what what do you think could happen? Yeah, I think you'd get the nail on the head with both of them there. Um, set pieces is our main strength and as much as everyone seems to know that it's going to be Dwight McNeil looping it to the back post for Tarkovsky to charge onto it's it's hard to stop when yeah. Tarkovsky's a funny one because he doesn't spring he's not got a great leap on him but he just seems to be great at getting on the his mark and just muscling his way to the ball he's he's really good at winning that that first um, that first knockdown so yeah that, that is definitely one and the main, yeah, the main positive coming out of, of the Bournemouth game for us was in GI. He, he played off the left hand side and was, was sparkling really. Just so many nice little touches, you know, dribbling the ball, crosses on either foot, having cutting his side on his right foot and having shots. Um, you know, we are in the, the Barclaysman trend, aren't we? At the moment, and he reminded <laughs> me of, of Stephen P. And I think had the actually had a really good record against Villa, didn't he? I remember scoring yes, a couple yeah. of belts against Villa. Yeah. Um, so if he can become the new P. And R. For us, and sort of be the Villa Park tormentor for a bit, then then that'll be that'll be lovely from our perspective. But um, obviously, it's one game. We're all very excited about him. Um, but you know, trying trying to it's 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 hard. You know, it's hard when you haven't had players with, with skill and speed for so long and you, you get one to try and keep you, your feet on the ground about <laughs> them and not get too excited but he does look a good player um, and of course we've got um, Mangala who came in on loan at the end of the transfer window so he'll be an option to sort of bolster the midfield as well um, but I imagine it'll be the, the two ex-Villa lads in addressing a and Rabu and who were starting for us in there yeah, it's uh, and Dyer's a funny one because I've got a friend of mine um, who's a Villa fan down here in London and he uh, played against Ilman and Dai on a part pitch in London when Indai was between clubs uh, before Sheffield United. So uh, I think at half time they decided to stick four players on him. Um, so he's come quite a long way from a part pitch in London to uh, playing for Everton at Aston Villa. It's uh, it's pretty great. But um, a bit like Hyde, Hyde FC, was it? I think at one point he had a really interesting journey. Like, mm. He obviously was a Sheffield United, then went to Marseille and it didn't quite work out for him. But it does seem to, yeah, have knocked around the lower leagues for a little bit, yeah. Yeah, very, very funny, funny story. A very rare story in modern football, really. But um, yeah. I guess with Aston Villa as well, um, I don't know how much you've seen this this season, but do you have any major concerns about uh, our players? Um, I mean, yeah, loads. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I think the weird, the weirdest one is that I think Watkins is on a bad run, isn't he? Yeah. At the moment, you know, and as much as every team thinks that the, you're the team that you want to play on when you're on a goal scoring run, trust me, it's not it's not you. It, it's us. We are we are the team <laughs> that um that break those droughts. So that's that's a concern. Obviously, he's a, no, he's a really good player. Um, Rogers looks really good, doesn't he? Uh, as well, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here, but he's, you know, maybe not quite got the end product yet. But his his ball carrying ability and his his directness has has, has been really impressive. And hmm. um, whatever I've seen, um, and obviously an honor in midfield as well. You know, I think no surprise that everyone's taken to him there really quickly in terms of his performances, in terms of his character. Um, goal scoring is not, you know. I mean, I'd be surprised if he continued going at two every three games. That would be uh, that would be some effort for the defensive midfielder. But um, <laughs> you've clearly Unai Emery taught him how to head the ball properly as well. Because <laughs> yeah. um, I've haven't got. I think I said on on our preview show when you signed him, he's got a fifty p head and he can't <laughs> head the ball properly. And then after the Brighton game back in the pub, after we've been smacked smacked three 0 seeing power one in <laughs> five minutes into his debut. So good for that <laughs> sorted out anyway. But. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously got loads of good players, haven't you? Um, I think the, the one, I mean, I might be wrong here, but it feels like he might be a bit light in defence the weekend, certainly on the right side. Yes. Obviously no cash, potentially no concert. Uh, Carlos is coming back, isn't he, as well, mm-hmm. and Ming. So uh, maybe a couple of, of kids playing there. So um, that could be an area, I reckon, you know, if Everton are going to exploit anything in an open play in the eye on that left-hand side against potentially some, you know, younger players playing on the right of the Villa defence. Feels, feels like our best bet, but... But yeah, I think we're going to be up against it. Mm. Well, I think last season in that fauna, I think um, Leon Bailey was absolutely un- unplayable. Yeah. And uh, he's going to be missing this weekend through all likelihood through a hamstring a string injury. Uh, we don't really know how long he's going to be out for, but I, I actually think I think he's quite a big miss. I think if Everton do do kind of just go defensive, he is he would have been the player to break that, that down, I think. And him not being there does give me a few... Few worries actually, but um, a player obviously I want to ask you about Tim Robinham. Uh, from what I've been seeing, Everton fans really seem to have taken to him. Um, how's he started for you? Yeah, he's been wonderful, he's, he's been really good. Been our, been our best player over the first three games, wow. like, com- comfortably. Um, I mean, the, the one the one issue he's got, which I've alluded to before, is that you can tell that after an hour or 70 minutes, the, the tank is empty. And again, that is, I think that is just a young player who's not played much football. Um, maybe should be protected a little bit by the manager. I, I, I kind of get it against Brighton because we had no midfielders on the bench really, but we had a few to call upon against against Bournemouth, so I don't know why he wasn't brought off there. But for an hour against Brighton and for 70 minutes against Bournemouth, he, he was outstanding. And he, he looks like a real all-rounder in, in terms of he's, he's obviously got uh, you know, the physical attributes. It looks like he's really difficult to knock off the ball, um, but loves to tackle, I think. His dual success rate has been, you know, one of the best in the the league this season. I can carry the ball. Seems to have a little little trick in him. Way to pass is good. Um, so yeah, he, he's been excellent. And but like I don't think Idrissa Gay is necessarily a, a, an ideal stylistic partner for him. Like it feels like they both want to go hunting the ball, and maybe one of them should just stay and be a bit more disciplined. Um, and maybe that's where someone like Mangala might be a, a bit more of a of a natural partner for for one of them. But but in terms of his individual attributes, you know, to to come to Everton and being a new club that's it's not, you know, the idea an ideal place to really bed young talent in or, or you know, help help develop your career. He's 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 really stood up. So um it certainly feels like of, of that those two linked deals where Everton got Iribunum and Aston Villa got Lewis Dobbin that maybe Everton have got the uh Come out on top. <laughs> <laughs> a fascinating deal that I'm still, yeah. I'm still wondering yeah, about. He starts, starts the game for West Brom, yeah, has he, Dobbin? <laughs> this week, so yeah, mad one. But you know, for, what was it between six and nine million? Everton got it, Boone and four. You know yeah. that that he, he looks he looks a player who, who could go on to become well beyond that. So yeah, delighted. Been been at the bright spark in our season, undoubtedly mm-hmm. so far. Love to hear that, you know. Love to hear former Villa players, especially young guys, going out and just doing really well. Um, and just a quick one of Jared Branthwaite. You did mention that he's back on the grass, as Sean Dyche said. Um, so, is there any hope he might be fit this weekend? I'd, I'd, I'd say I'd, I'd give it like twenty five percent. He'll play. Yeah. Um, and I, I think ultimately Everton have got to be realistic in the sense that this is this is going to be a really tough game, even if Jared Branthwaite is available. Um, we've got a cup game against Southampton. 
midweek after that, and then we've got Leicester away and, and Palace at home, like like I said earlier. And I think if he's not a hundred percent, then you don't risk him because those following games, you know, getting through to the next round of the cup, two games which are much look much more winnable. Um, for Everton, I think I think you just keep him back for that. Um, so I'd be I'd be surprised if he if he started. Um, if he was in the squad, that that would be a major boost for us. But um, Dice doesn't really rush people back in that sense. You know, he's not someone who's going to bring him off like the last half an hour. I think he'll he'll either have him in the eleven or not be near it at all. So um, I'd be surprised, but you know, fingers crossed from our point of view. Right, and uh, you know, I'm not going to ask um, for predictions and all that just because I think it's a bit. <laughs> Can be a bit un- unfair on people to put them on the spot like that. <laughs> but uh, do you think Everton can get a result? Is there a, is there a way in which it can actually happen? Yeah, I mean, of course they can. Yeah, it's you know, I think you've got a big week coming up, haven't you? Yeah. Um, and I mean, there's obviously been other stuff with the, the ticket prices, and like, I don't know if that'll be a factor or not. Make the atmosphere a bit weird mm. on Saturday. Um, you know, which uh, not my place, but one absolute scandal that's been over the last fortnight, but. So maybe if things are a little bit, you know, a little bit sleepy there. The atmosphere is a bit weird. Eyes on Champions League in midweek, perhaps. Got a couple of young lads playing in defence. Everything will capitalise on that. And like this, this, this team has shown under on on the dice that they can go away from home and be like a bit of a bastard to play against. We haven't seen it for a while, but they have, they have got it in the locker. Um, so I think if if you can get through that first half an hour, if you can get to an hour, and it's you know it's nil nil or you know they're only one goal down or you know they they, they sneak a goal ahead, then they can do it. It's just they just need to remember how to do it. They, they've not done it for a while. Now they haven't won away from home this calendar year, which um. So I think I think it's just about getting getting to certain points in the game, trying to break it down, get to an hour, get to sixty, and and, and just see where they're at. Um, but I certainly think they're capable of, of going and just. Making it difficult, maybe maybe nicking a point with a, with a goal from a set piece or something like that. But it's you know, it, it's not going to be easy. You know they are massive underdogs. You've got to say. Yeah, I think uh, I, yeah. As I say, a lot of our players have been international duty. A few of them were out in South America playing over there in tough games. Um, oh, stop bragging! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got all these Brazilian and Argentina internationals. You know, it's, that must yeah. be hard. Must be hard. Colombia as well. So yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh, but yeah, we're. Um, I don't know, and Leon Bailey been missing a few doubts about where the concert's there. I think I don't know. I'm a little bit edgier than I probably would be uh, mm. in under normal circumstances. But yeah, we'll see. Um, anyway, Everton proper club, you know the the dictionary definition of a proper club. So I hope I hope they can get their act together later this season after the Villa game, of course. Um, <laughs> but, but Matt, um, it's been brilliant to chat to you. Always really enjoy having you on the show. Um, where can we find you and your work online? Yeah, so I'm at Matt J Football on. Uh, Twitter, um, Liverpool Echo is at Live Echo EFC. That's for, for all your um, coverage. And then if you want instant reactions to the game on Saturday, we, we're doing it at the Blue Room as well. So that's at the Blue Room EFC online. So yeah, um, I'm sure it'll be joyful come Saturday evening um, and throughout the season. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks a lot for coming on, Matt. No worries, mate. Thank you. 